Hey, well, welcome again, guys. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Russ. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're tuning in online, welcome to you. I'm so happy you're with us. Um, we have been in a series that we've called The Awkward Dinner Guest. The Awkward Dinner Guest. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, um, eating meals together is something really important and a value of us as a community. Anyone like to share good food together? Yeah, amen. Anyone been a part of tables, kicked off their tables this last week? Yeah, had a good time? Yeah, a couple of us? All right, great. Um, <laughs> I've loved it. I've been uh, leading with Austin Bro, the college men table, and it has been a blast. We've been having so much fun. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a value of ours. We want to break bread together. But we also want to turn our attention to the meals of Jesus uh, because we find when we study the ministry of Jesus that he's constantly eating meals with people. He's constantly breaking bread with people. And he does so because it reveals something about us, about our own hearts and lives, and something about God. Next week, we're going to be concluding this series. I cannot believe we've already gone six weeks, but we're going to be concluding this series next Sunday with um, one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. I don't know if this is TMI, but you know what? This would not be the first time I shared a little too much information. So uh, I have two tattoos One in Hebrew right here, and one in Greek on my back. I'm going to let you guess where it's placed on my back. Um, But this, uh, this, this, the tattoo in Greek on my back is actually from this chapter in Scripture that we're going to be studying next week. That's how important it is to me, and that's how powerful of a story it is. So I hope you join us next Sunday for the conclusion of the Awkward Dinner Guest. And the week after that uh, is Pentecost Sunday, where it's a special Sunday where we remember Um, after Jesus has been ascended into heaven to the right hand of the Father, when God pours out his spirit on his disciples. And then the spirit of Jesus becomes our advocate, becomes our comforter, our truth teller, to bind us into a community and to lead us into all grace and truth. So that's going to be the following Sunday, June 5th. And then we're going to be starting a new series a Sunday after that, which I'm not even going to worry telling you about it, because in our day and age, we can't even remember what happened yesterday and what's coming up tomorrow. So, um, but it's going to be a really exciting time in the life of our church. I hope you're uh, able to join us. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22 today. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to that, Luke chapter 22, we're going to be reading verses 14 through 20. Uh, it's, it's a longer story. We've condensed it to the meat and potatoes of the story, pun intended, um, and um, for our purposes. But we're in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. Perhaps you will recognize it. And this is what we read. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I don't know if you've ever had a meal that deeply transformed your life or had a a series of meal, a recurring meal that transformed your life. Uh, I remember in April 2020, uh, Anna and I, we were supposed to take a little trip to Paris. We were unable to do so because of the pandemic. But just on on a whim, we decided to take a charcuterie board upstairs. We were living in New York City at the time, so we took it upstairs to our rooftop. We turned on our little French bistro Spotify playlist, very stereotypical. But we did it. We had our charcuterie. It was a beautiful sunset in New York. And we just enjoyed one another's presence. We gave thanks um, uh, to the Lord for being with us. It was a powerful meal. I don't know if you ever had something like that where you just look back on. And uh, it's a meal that just left an indelible imprint on your life. Or maybe it's a recurring meal. So in my house growing up, that was Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was the holiday where all of my mom's side of the family and my dad's side of the family came to us. So we'd have 40 or 50 family members in our house in North Carolina. It's when we had 
all the dishes that we never ate the rest of the year. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm from North Carolina, so we love casseroles. So I had my annual allotment of cream of mushroom soup. for like I didn't need it for the rest of the year. It was in every casserole. We'd always play our turkey bowl football game. Cousin Alex would inevitably twist an ankle or tear his ACL or something. Wouldn't you know it, he was back out there the following year. Nothing was going to stop him. It was like a special day. This was, this was the holiday that, that we looked forward to. We'd get excited, right, as it drew closer. There was such memory attached to it. I learned recently um, about uh, uh, the Jewish ghetto in the city of Rome. And uh, this was a, an area in Rome where, uh, for the last 500 years, uh, Roman citizenry would, would confine all the Jewish people. And they lived there for hundreds of years. And then when Nazi Germany um, occupied Rome, obviously all 1,204 of its residents were sent to the concentration camps where most of them perished. Only a few young children uh, were hid by their, um, by their families and they escaped. And when the children sort of grew up and they came back to their home where they had grown up, one of the first things they did, one of the first things, is they began to cook together. They began to make the meals of their childhood. Because those meals, one commentator said, this food became a vital link to their past. That's not just emotional or spiritual, it's scientific. There's neuroscience attached to this that we've discovered. Food is directly tied to our memories. I, I'm sorry that a lot of my examples right now is Disney movies, but that's just the season of life I'm in. So if you've seen the movie Ratatouille, again, you know what I'm talking about, where the French critic, the food critic, you know, he, he can never be pleased, and then this final scene, um, he eats a dish, and it just transports him back to being a child where he was eating that dish that his mom had made him, right? It tastes like mom's. It tastes like grandma. Um, that's not, that, that's, that's scientific. It is actually proven. Food is tied to our memories. And here's why. Because we know that taste and smell is in the part of our brain known as the olfactory system, which incidentally, as we've been living through the pandemic, the olfactory system has been targeted by COVID. So the olfactory system is where our taste and smell resides, which is right beside the amygdala. Some of you guys are just, I realize I'm, you know, you don't care, but there are a couple nerds, fellow nerds in the room who are loving this right now. <laughs> but the olfactory system is right beside the amygdala, which is where our emotions are, and, and specifically our emotional learning, which is right beside the hippocampus, which is where our memories are. So there's three things in our brain that deal with our memories, our emotions, and taste and smell that are very much intertwined. Interestingly, we've learned that smell is the only fully developed sense in the fetus, in a fetus. And smell is the most powerful sense that a child has until the age of 10, which is why so much of what we like or don't like which is why we smell things and are immediately transported back to childhood. And taste and sm smell really influences what we taste. So, so much of, of um, the power of our identities, our emotions, our memories are formed in childhood and are formed around food. And Jesus knows this. Jesus is the creator. He knows how he made us. And so, therefore, he knows what will reach us. So when he sits down in this story to a meal with his disciples, it's not just any ordinary meal. It's a special meal. And he's doing something very unique with it. This is known as the Passover. And some of you may know what the Passover is. For those who don't, that's totally fine. Passover was like Thanksgiving and Christmas rolled into one for the Jewish people. Passover was the meal for an Israelite, because it represented the, the birth of their people in many ways. When they were slaves in Egypt, in captivity in Egypt, God, through the hand of Moses, delivered the Israelites out of slavery. 
delivered them from captivity and redeemed them, ransomed them, formed them into a new people. And the sign of that deliverance, the sign of that salvation was this meal called Passover. We actually see it for the first time in Exodus chapter 12. This is before God has redeemed Israel out of Egypt, but he's preparing them for it. And this is what we read. We're going to read verses 1 through 14 in Exodus 12. This is what we read. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. And you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate, or in other translations it says, this is a day of remembrance. Remembrance. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So again, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, they are in Egypt, they're in slavery, and God says, I'm going to redeem you. Egypt is going to release you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to do it through a Passover. I'm going to strike down the firstborn in Egypt humans and animals, you are going to take a lamb. You're going to kill the lamb. You're going to put the blood over the door frames. So when I see the blood, I recognize that this has been sacrificed so you might be saved, and I'm going to pass over. And then as you eat the meal, you're going to eat the meal as a sign of God's deliverance of you, and you're going to go out in haste. And every year, you're going to eat it again and again, and you're going to recreate the scene. You're going to eat it fast, with your children, recreate the scene to remind them so that they might remember what God has done on your behalf. That God is the one who redeemed you out of slavery and has formed you into a new people. The memory of this meal for for Jesus' disciples, for a Jewish man or woman, is the memory of their people being saved when they should have been destroyed. Their people being delivered against all odds. It's the memory of the exodus from Egypt, the salvation of Israel. And that memory was tied to very distinct emotions of of joy, but also of sorrow, of grief for the people that were lost, for how hard it's been to be this people, and of gratitude. And when the Jewish people would gather to eat the Passover, the smells of the lamb and the bitter herbs and eating it fast, it would tie the emotion to their memories. And they would remember who their God is. And so here we have in this scene, Jesus eating the Passover with his disciples. And he celebrates it as any observant Jewish man would. Everything is great. He's doing it perfectly, except at the very end, he does something astonishing. He doesn't look to the lamb and say, we need to eat all the lamb. Instead, what he says is that his body and his blood is the true sacrifice. This is the true sacrificial meal that achieves deliverance for you, my disciples, and not just for you, but for the world out of true bondage, true spiritual slavery. This is what's going to achieve the salvation of all humankind. Now, maybe if you're an observant um, reader, you're like, okay, that's great, 
but where's the lamb? That's a good question. The lamb's not there, right? He's both pointing to himself, but then he doesn't just point to himself. He lifts up bread and wine. Now, where does that come from? Thank you for asking. There's another meal in the Old Testament for the Jewish people that is also incredibly important to their memories and to their emotions. It's known as, it's less of a meal, it's more of a a food, but it's known as the bread of the presence, the bread of the presence. We see this uh, emerge later on in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 25, we're told God tells his people of Israel as they're in the desert, as they're walking to the promised land, they're delivered, they're a new people. He says, I want you to make me a tabernacle. Make me this small little portable tent that will go in the center of you as you travel. And I'm gonna give you specific directions on how big and how wide it's supposed to be. And in this tabernacle, there are three really holy things. There's the Ark of the Covenant, where the tablets of the law were given. There's golden lampstand. And there's a table that holds the bread of the presence, which a lot of scholars say were 12 different loaves of bread, uh, loaves of cake that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, it wasn't just bread, because when you read it in Exodus 25, we're actually told that beside the bread on the table are pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. So really, there's sacrificial offerings of of, um, liquid there as well, which would have been wine, So it's probably better to say the bread and wine of the presence. And interestingly, when you translate the Hebrew, it's lahem ha panim, where we get presence, but a more literal translation would be face, the bread of the face. So in a sense, in the tabernacle is bread and wine of the face of God. Now, where did they get this idea? You got to go one chapter before it, Exodus 24, before the commands to build the tabernacle, where this is what we read in Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. So one chapter before God tells them to build a tabernacle, the key leaders of the people of Israel get to go up the mountain, and they get to have a feast in the presence of God. They see God, and God does not destroy them. They go back down the mountain, and God says, now I want you to build a tabernacle where my presence is going to dwell. And one of the items uh, in the tabernacle of my presence is going to be the bread and wine that represented the heavenly banquet that you just participated in. As a sign, we read in Leviticus, as a sign of God's eternal covenant with the people of Israel, that he is the God who eats with his people, and he is a God who will eat with his people again in the future. So every Sabbath, the priest would bake new loaves, and they would put them in the tabernacle to represent that God's face, God's presence was with them. Interestingly, as time went on um, and the temple was built, again, the same items are there. Uh, We actually have documentation that the priest, um, when they baked the loaves, before they would put it in the temple, They would hold it up in front of the people, and they would say, behold how much God loves you. So they would turn the bread. Behold how much God loves you, that he would eat with you. This is his everlasting promise to never abandon you. This was a special meal in the presence of Israel that the people knew meant that God loved them. So for me, for me, growing up, um, on our birthdays, my mom would always cook us a special meal. We've got a special meal. Maybe you did that as well. And my favorite meal growing up, do not knock it until you try it, was called chicken liver spaghetti. Those are groans of like, you're just, you're, you're salivating right now, aren't you? I can tell. Chicken liver spaghetti. And with the exception of my dad, the rest of my family They just didn't have a refined palate like us. So they didn't enjoy it that much. 
We got it twice a year, my dad's birthday and my birthday. <laughs> and we were excited. It actually, guys, it got so bad, I don't understand this, but apparently there wasn't a high demand for chicken livers. So uh, at a certain point, they stopped selling it at grocery stores, so my mom had to go to bait shops to buy chicken livers for our meal. That's how much she said, behold how much I love you. <laughs> I went to a fish shop. <laughs> We're going to consume this. But it was a sign. It was a sign of, in, in a sense, the promise of my family. Behold how much we love you, Russ. We're going to put this in our stomachs. <laughs> Likewise, the bread and wine of the presence was a sign of God saying, this is the covenant I'm making with you. Behold, I am with you. So in this meal, Jesus points to the bread and the wine, which the disciples recognize would have been pointing to the bread of the presence. And he's with his 12 disciples. He's offering the bread and the wine. He's forming a new covenant, which was what the bread of the presence was attached to. He's saying, eat it and remember me. He's saying, this is my body. This is my blood. This is my face. I mean, to, to really understand what's going on in this scene, imagine for a moment, let's go back to Thanksgiving, right? Hopefully that's the most uh, recognizable for us. So you have your traditions in Thanksgiving, right? And for my house, everyone gathered, the whole family gathered. We had certain dishes that we never had, and this wasn't a tradition, but just imagine if it was, that maybe the matriarch of my family, um, she would always cut the turkey before we ate, right? Imagine, and this is, everyone looks forward to it. It's, it's beautiful, everyone loves it. Imagine Jesus having grown up in the family and then, and then one Thanksgiving without saying anything, pushing the matriarch aside and saying, hey guys, like, I'm going to cut the turkey from now on. This is my family. Also, I'm the turkey that you're about to feast on as well. You would have been like, well, that's probably truer than you realize, Jesus. Right? That's a, like, this is, this is offensive. Like, what is he doing? Not only is he saying, I'm going to cut the turkey now, but also this gift, this meal was provided by me, and this is the family of a sign of my love, of my covenant with you. Jesus is, is holding true to the meal, but he's also altering it in profound ways. What is he doing? Well, Jesus understands something about memory and how our memories actually work. I'm gonna geek out just for a couple more minutes. So if you need to text someone, go ahead and text someone. For the rest of you, you can pay attention. <laughs> couple more minutes about how memory actually works. So for many of us, for most of us, when we think about where are our memories, how is memory stored in our brain? We probably think about computers, right? You have files on computers. They're stored there. They're safe there. They're secure. All you have to do is know where to look, access them, retrieve them, they pop up, and everything's there as it happened. That's called the standard theory of memory. And that's what people have believed for thousands of years, and what we've recently discovered is not true. <laughs> that's not how memory works. And they discovered this through a study, and a couple different studies that confirmed it, but one of my favorites, there was a study at NYU it involves a little animal cruelty. I'm sorry, I was not the one who did it. But there were some rats that they conditioned to fear a sound. They would play a sound, and then they would um, give them a small shock after the sound was played. So they conditioned the rats to fear the sound. Every time the sound was played, the rats would get afraid. They knew that a shock was coming. And what they wanted to do was see that if they could intercept the rats, as they're remembering what that sound meant, could they change their memories and their emotions tied to it? And in fact, they discovered they could. That what they did was they played the sound, and as the rats were beginning to get afraid to remember, they injected them with the substance. Don't worry about what it is. It just helps them block the memories. <laughs> and as they injected that, the rats forgot what the sound meant, and they stopped exhibiting signs of fear. Now, maybe you're confused. I get it. I was too. 
Here's ultimately what they've discovered about memory. That our memories are only as real as the process of remembering them. Now you're like, Russ, I'm still very much confused. <laughs> what does that mean? Imagine this. Microsoft Word. Something happens in your life. You write it down. That's document one, right? And you save it. That memory only exists when you remember it again. And when you remember it, the, the neurotransmitters have to trace in your brain. All over it, you relive the memory. It becomes real again. But here's the thing that happens. When you remember it and you read the document again, you actually don't remember all the details. You remember the gist of it, but a lot of the details you kind of recreate. So you edit it. And then you save it, and now that's now document two. And you keep pulling that story out at the Thanksgiving dinner table, right? You tell the, the story of the time that grandma got ran over by a reindeer. Everyone loves that story. You tell it over and over and over and over again. You've told it 44 times. At the next Thanksgiving, when you pull out that document to tell the story again, you are not pulling out document one. Document one doesn't exist and hasn't existed for many years. You're pulling out document 44, which has been really edited. Maybe the, the, the key details are still there. Grandma really did get run over by a reindeer. But a lot of the other stuff has shifted. And why that's important is that tells us that memories are not fixed and inviolable with a, a interception, with an appropriate interception of new data, you can change the memory and you can change the emotion attached to the memory, which is why the rats were no longer fearing the sound. You can change the memory and the emotion. Our memories are ever impressionable to new interceptions that fundamentally change the memory change our emotion, and change our identities forever. What is Jesus doing with the Passover and the bread of the presence? He's intercepting the Israelites' memories of them. He's providing new data that fundamentally changes the meal, changes their emotion about the meal, and therefore changes the identity of the people forever. The emotion is true, says Jesus. God did save you out of slavery. God did redeem you. That sense of joy and gratitude, that is true. But now, here's what I want you to know. Here on, hereafter, though you've had 2,000 documents of this, here's what I want you to know. The true sacrificial lamb that has redeemed not just you, but the entire world out of not just the slavery of Egypt, but the slavery to sin and death is not a lamb, but is me, is my body and blood. Edit that out. Edit the lamb out. Put Jesus here. I am the true sacrificial lamb. And I have paid the ransom that the entire earth might go free. God is saying, Jesus is saying to us that the true bread and wine in the presence is not just a loaf of cake and a little bit of wine. It's actually my body and my blood. Behold the love of God. Behold the face of God that has been offered to you as a sign of an eternal, everlasting covenant of how much God loves you. He didn't just give you a loaf of bread and wine. He gave you his very son. Edit that out. It's going to change the memory. It's going to change your emotion of how great this God is, how much he actually loves me, and it's going to change my identity as a human being and as his followers for the rest of our lives. Jesus understands how memories work. He's tapping into the most formative moments of his disciples' history, of their past, of their lives, and he's giving them new data that deepens their understanding of who God is and how great his love is for them. And of course, it's food. He chooses a meal to do this because there are a few things more deeply formative to our memories, our emotions, and our identities than a meal. As C.T. McMahon says, the meal, one of humankind's most basic and common practices, was transformed by Jesus into an occasion of divine encounter. In a sense, what Jesus is saying is at the table, he wants you to re remember your past, your present, and to think on your future, because there's always going to be a table there. And when you do so, he wants you to know that you're not alone 
at the table. You've never been alone at the table. For some of us, the table has really good memories associated. And that is good, and that's right and true. But Jesus says it's still incomplete until you know the heavenly banquet that I'm taking you to. And for some of us, we have really painful memories associated with the table. Parents that weren't there. Stress, friction, eating alone, all sorts of stuff. And Jesus says, I want you to know that even when you were eating that bread and wine by yourself, you were eating me. My presence was still with you. Behold, my love. He's intercepting the depths of our memories and our identity so that we would know that there is no place in the cosmos. There's no place in our lives where the love of God revealed in Jesus has not been present with us. He's always been there. And he's still always going to be there. Unto eternity, the sign of the everlasting covenant. And the hope is The belief is that just like the rats, when the memory is intercepted, the fear is replaced by a new emotion. When our memories are intercepted by this truth that Jesus has offered his body and his blood for us, his very life, that Jesus has paid the price so that we can go free, completely accepted and free, that that too will change our emotions about ourselves, that we will be filled with gratitude, filled with joy, filled with life, because behold how much God loves you. Behold how much he loves you. It's not just bread, it's his very son. God has met us at a meal in order to intercept and transform our lives. Which is why when the Jewish people returned to the Roman ghetto, the first thing they did was cook. Because in the cooking, it helped them recapture the memories of the past to deal with their joy and their grief in the present and also to project into the future a hope of reunion. See, what we see in this meal is the invitation of Jesus, the longing, the longing of Jesus, that Jesus wants to meet you in your memories. He wants to meet you in your past, usually over food. He wants to meet you there to intercept them with himself, that your emotions would know that you've never been alone. That's a powerful reality, guys. The, re, the, the remembrance, the recognition when you look back and you realize that he was with me the entire time, that I was never alone, that does something. He wants to intercept that, say you've never been alone even when you thought you were alone. And that grief, that was my grief too, I was grieving with you. And that joy, that was my joy too, I was sharing that joy with you. I have been with you yesterday, I will be with you today, and I will be with you tomorrow. Behold, I am the lamb that is sacrificed so that you can be free, and I'm not just the lamb, I'm also the face of God that has come as a sign that you'll never be alone ever again. And you can know this because every time you eat and drink, you can do this and remember me. Remember what I've done. Remember who I am. Let me be the center of the table and fill you with hope for the future. No longer are we able to recount, once it's been intercepted by Jesus, no longer are we able to recount our past griefs and not see him there. The data shows that he has always been there and always will. I remember uh, my family, so I have two brothers, and um, we grew up, and, and family dinner was a really big deal in our house. Um, we, we tried to eat family dinner as much as possible. We had those eat and learn placemats. Anyone else have the eat and learn placemats? You know what I'm talking about? I learned all my presidents in order for a period of life. There was a time where I knew the first 39 elements in the periodic table of elements. Don't quiz me now, because I don't retain that. That memory is gone. I have not remembered it. But we loved it. We would have family dinner. We would talk about our days, um, but 
Dinners were not always great. There was a lot of friction. Three boys growing up. There were some dinners, some seasons in life where dinners were, were really hard. My eldest brother was the last one to become a Christian in our family. He became a Christian at age 27. And the interesting thing about that, uh, I grew up in Raleigh, Durham, as I said. And um, uh, when he became a Christian, the, my brothers and I, we were living in other places. We, interestingly, school and other things brought us back to the Raleigh area. So we were all in Raleigh for like six months, nine months. And then my dad um, was called uh, to take a new job in Virginia. And so my parents moved. They sold their house and moved from Raleigh to Virginia. But that was the house we all grew up in. This was our family home. So many memories. And I still remember um, that the last night, the last family dinner we had in our childhood home where so much had happened. When we finished, we actually decided to take communion together as a family. And this was the first time we were taking communion as a family at home, not at church. This was the first time that every single one of us wanted to take communion together. And we sort of passed around the bread and the wine and we looked at each other and we said a prayer and there were tears in our eyes because it was our last night really in, in our childhood home. But it was such a powerful moment. It was a moment where our minds were open to who God is and how present he had been in our lives. Because we looked in each other's eyes and we didn't just see joy. There was that. Man, we saw, I, I remember the time when, uh, when we got so angry, we banged the table and broke glass. I remember that. I remember the time where there were people missing from the table because of stuff happening in life. But we looked at one another and we recognized that every time we had eaten together, Jesus was, had always been with us. He was there at every single family meal. And he was still there. And even though the table is about to change and we're about to be sent out, he's still at the center of our family. He intercepted our memories. He intercepted what we imagined to change our emotions about who he is and how much he loved us and to give us a hope, to give us a strong, solid hope that he would be with us unto the ends of the earth. And it's not that Jesus intercepts individuals. Jesus also intercepts communities. Because it's not just the 12 disciples individually. It's the 12 disciples as a new family. Jesus also, when we come to the table as a community, we come and have our communal, our collective memory intercepted, which is important for us as a church. Our collective memory of how much God has done for us in the past, though it's been hard, how he's still present today because behold how much God loves us and how he will be with us tomorrow and the next day and the next. So what we're gonna do in this last bit of time is we're gonna come to the table as a community. I wanna invite the band back up. And as we do so, the invitation is the same. If you're here and you're not so sure about Jesus, but there's something happening in your heart that you want to come to his table, you want to confess, you want to say, Lord, uh, Jesus, I, I want to know the depths of your love, and I want to know what it's like to have you intercept my memories, to deal with my grief, my past, my sorrow, and to heal it. Well, then this table is open for you. And for those of us who have taken communion before, once again, we come to the table and we're reminded of the truth. That Jesus, not just a sacrificial lamb, but Jesus himself is the one who came for you and for me and for us, who laid down his life to set us free. And Jesus is a sign of the everlasting covenant of God's love for us. And not just individually, but Jesus is the sign of the everlasting covenant that he's made with his people here. And so to do so, we thought it'd be really cool um, to serve communion. If you're serving communion, you can go ahead and come forward. One of the things I love about this church is that um, it is a church where God reveals himself to each generation. And this is a church of generations. And so we have people representing various generations who have met Jesus in this community, in this place, who are going to be serving his everlasting love that was the same yesterday, today, 
and forever to us. So I want to say a word of prayer. You can go ahead and stand to your feet. And then we have a couple stations. Each row has one. And then there's also two stations in the back for those unable to come forward. And we're just going to take some time and we're going to reflect on the love of Jesus for us and for our community. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you that you have met us in the depths of our memories. Those places that we think can't be touched because they're too far gone, there's too much sorrow, too much grief, you've met us there. And you've met us there to actually give us new information, to tell us that we were never alone there. That we've never been alone in our grief, we've never been alone in our sorrow, we've never been alone in our questions. You've always been present. Jesus, you came to the earth. You laid down your life. You gave us your body and your blood in the form of this meal so that we would know that we have been set free, that no powers of sin or death, nothing in our past nor our future can remove us from the freedom we have through your love. If there's anyone here who doesn't know that, God, I ask that they would believe that today, that they would trust your love and that you would meet them, Holy Spirit, with the fullness of your love. And Lord, as we look to the bread and the cup, would we see it and remember that this is a sign of your eternal love for us? Would we even hear in our hearts the angels and the elders crying out, behold, how much God loves you. Because you didn't just send bread and wine. You sent your son. Would we not question, or when we do question, would we direct our questions to you, recognizing, Lord, that you can handle all of our emotions because you've always been present with us. And as a community, God, would this bind us together? Would we remember how far you've brought us? How faithful is your presence and how far you're going to take us, even though we don't know where we're going, but you do and we trust you. And lastly, Lord, as we take this meal, would we remember that we're not just taking it as our own church. We're actually joining our brothers and sisters all across the world today who are sharing in this meal having their lives intercepted by you, Jesus, by your love, by your sacrifice, that we might be the new family of God, the new creation. So Lord, I don't know what pain people are feeling. I don't know what sorrow they're feeling. I don't know what emotions they're feeling. Whatever emotions they're feeling, would you invite them to your table to receive your sacrificial love and to know that you are with them and you are with us. Thank you, God, that you're trustworthy. We behold your love today.